we know we're historically part of the Jewish people and we want to reconnect to that destiny and being able to kind of be forerunners in talking to those communities about their identity and about the reality according to the scriptures that our Jewish identity is only and always fulfilled through faith in Jesus, the promised Jewish Messiah. Welcome to A Jew and a Gentile Discuss. I'm your co-host, Carly Berna. And I'm Ezra Benjamin. We're a Jew and a Gentile who both believe in Jesus and believe that there is value in looking at history as well as today's world and the headlines through both a Jewish and Christian lens. Today, we have the opportunity to actually hear Ezra's testimony, which I'm excited about. I feel like as a Christian, it's always exciting when you get to hear someone's testimony, but even more interesting when it's a Jewish believer explaining their testimony. Because as a Christian, often sometimes people say, oh, I just, you know, I've been a Christian my whole life. I was raised in the church, etc." That's never really the case with a Jewish believer. Um, so I'm excited to hear many things I probably don't already know about Ezra. Um, and I think this is an exclusive unveiling. I don't think Ezra's testimony has been shared uh, anywhere like this before. So let's get into it. So Ezra, let's start with, as a, as a young Ezra, where did you grow up? As a young Ezra. Yeah, I grew up in Western New York. And let me say, you know, we're calling this Ezra's testimony. Let's call it Ezra's story, right? Because typically, Carly, when you hear somebody's testimony, right, you hear about like everything that built up to their salvation experience, right? And then they receive Jesus as Lord and then like everything gets better. And that's sort of the story. So I'm going to just call this Ezra's story. Absolutely, my coming to faith in Jesus, in Yeshua, as we say in Hebrew, is a big part of this, but then everything got complicated. So anyway, that's part of the story, and we'll fill it in. But I grew up in New York State, not New York City. My dad grew up in New York City, but I have no claims on New York City other than that we visited like once every couple of years when I was growing up. I grew up in boring New York and not even cool like upstate New York, like Albany or Yonkers or the Hudson River Valley. We were way over by Niagara Falls, which is apple and snowstorm country. And the only thing we had in common with New York City was the taxes. So the other part of New York. Okay. So you said this is Ezra's story. I'll just say this is Ezra's story thus far then, because it's not like it's over. We're just, you know, part way through. So what was your awareness of your family background? You know, you were, you're from New York. What did you think about your heritage at that time? Yeah. So it's a good question. And there's kind of a sidebar issue here that our audience, uh, some of our audience, Carly, are Jewish people who maybe don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they're curious about what we have to say. Others are people who maybe identify as Jewish believers. Some people are Christians who would say, I have a Jewish heritage. And then a significant portion of our listening audience is Christian with no Jewish background. So how did I identify growing up is a good question. My, uh, I, I'm, I'm the product of what's more and more common. It was, it was common among the baby boomers, and my parents are very much baby boomers, and it's even more common now among Xers and millennials and uh, cuspers, if you're familiar with that, between the Xers and the millennials or the cuspers. Um, and that's uh, what's called a mixed marriage. So I'm the child of a mixed marriage, and that means one parent is Jewish and the other is not Jewish. So my dad's Jewish and my mom is not. My mom became a Christian when she was in college, and her story is kind of cool. She was uh, actually hit by a truck and ended up in the hospital and around that time and some other kind of very difficult things that happened in, in her family. She came to faith, but my my dad is Jewish, my mom's not, so that's how we define mixed marriage. And in the Jewish world, you know, the, the perennial question is who's Jewish, right? How do you define who's Jewish? And we talk a little bit about this in other podcast uh, episodes, Carly. And if you haven't heard uh, our other episodes, jump online and find them. But uh, real quickly, biblically, way back when, uh, somebody would be Jewish generally if they had a Jewish father or if they had a Jewish father or mother in kind of the broader definition. Rabbinic Judaism, for a lot of reasons that we talk more extensively about in other episodes, has in the last many centuries defined being Jewish as having a Jewish mother. So if your father is Jewish and your mother is not, then it may surprise a lot of our audience to know that the rabbis actually don't consider you Jewish. 
they consider you what's called the descendant of a Jew. So if you define rabbinically Jewish people in the world, which is people with a Jewish mother, there's about 15 million, give or take. That number used to be 13, and then more communities have kind of come on the radar. But if you define uh, somebody who's Jewish as having a Jewish parent, either father or mother, or a Jewish grandparent, uh, which is how the state of Israel defines somebody's right to kind of immigrate and become a citizen of the Jewish state, of the modern state of Israel, that number jumps to over 22 million. So I'm part of that larger definition of, I mean, I consider myself Jewish. I was raised Jewish, of course, in a faith community, and we'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. But rabbinically, um, the rabbis wouldn't consider me Jewish because my mother's not. My mother's uh, Gentile uh, from a Christian background. But I'm part of that other seven and a half million people who are part of that kind of broader Jewish community, but who aren't rabbinically recognized as, as Jewish. So how did I understand myself growing up? Well, my parents, you know, one was Jewish, one was not. Also, my mom was a believer and my dad, uh, very sympathetic, but not a believer. But my mom understood, hey, I have these two Jewish children, not necessarily rabbinically Jewish, but their heritage, their ethnicity, at least on my dad's side, and their their history, uh, their background is that these are two Jewish sons. And so my mom, as a believer, you know, when, when kind of spent some time away from the Lord and came back to him when I was probably five years old. And my mom was wrestling with, okay, what do I do with these two kids? I want them to understand who they are and their heritage. But, you know, of course, I believe in, in Jesus. So we ended up at a Messianic congregation, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But growing up, I understood that my mom is a believer in Jesus, in Yeshua, and that I have a Jewish background. I am Jewish. My parents emphasized that. Uh, and so growing up, it was sort of this hybrid message, which when you're a kid, your reality is your reality, right? And so you just accept it. Growing up later, that became much more complicated to reconcile. And I know we're going to talk about that in a moment. Okay. So you came from a mixed marriage, one Jewish parent, one Christian parent. What was your religious experience like? Did you go to a church? Did you go to a synagogue? At what point did you go to a Messianic Jewish congregation? Yeah, when my mom came back to the Lord and realized, okay, you know, I have a responsibility here to raise my Jewish sons, uh, hopefully in the knowledge of Jesus, of Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, we ended up at a uh, small but growing Messianic Jewish congregation in Rochester, New York, uh, where I grew up. And I'll say it with my best Rochesterian accent. Every O with a Rochesterian accent is translated into five to six A's. So Rochester, New York. Uh, a Messianic congregation there. And what, what we mean by that real briefly is a congregation made up in large part of Jewish people and others who either were married to Jewish people or really felt a burden to kind of stand in solidarity with Jewish people, all of whom were worshiping Jesus, Yeshua, as, as the Messiah of Israel, according to the scriptures, according to the prophets, and the Savior of the world. So it was a place where Jesus was being worshiped, for his messiahship, his lordship in a Jewish way, celebrating the Jewish holidays, kind of Jewish flavored music. And uh, and that congregation was led by uh, a young Jewish believer in his early 30s on his way to being entirely bald named Jonathan Burnus. So uh, that name may ring a bell for some of our listeners. Uh, Carly, you and I work for Jonathan Burnus today at Jewish Voice Ministries, but this was decades before and uh, so he was the leader of that congregation. Jonathan led that congregation. And so I ended up there probably five, six years old and joined the Shabbat school, which for our Christian audience is the Jewish version of Sunday school. And I was part of kind of the kids ministry at this Messianic congregation in Rochester. And that was my first experience uh, kind of in a worship or church or congregational environment. And my first introduction to, uh, to Jesus, to Yeshua. So how did your faith journey grow and change as you grew up in your youth? Yeah, so I was in the Shabbat school there, but not quite like youth group age, not a teenager, pre-teenager. And as the story goes, Jonathan really felt called by the Lord to move to St. Petersburg, Russia and start reaching Jewish people kind of in mass by renting theaters and stadiums and sharing the good news of Jesus, of Yeshua with people who lived in USSR that, you know, 
former Soviet Union at that point, almost former Soviet Union, who had never been exposed or allowed by the government even to understand that God is real. And so they didn't know what to do with their Jewish background. So Jonathan moved to the other side of the world for several reasons. We ended up leaving the Messianic congregation. And I think my parents said, you know, what do we do now? And I wasn't really part of that conversation because I was all of eight years old. And so we ended up at a at a non-denominational community church in also in Rochester. Uh, and that's, you know, at eight years old through 18, where I ended up, like I was in the youth group and I'm like, okay, message of Jesus at the Messianic congregation, message of Jesus here at the church. Good for me. It felt kind of consistent. All right. It's on Sundays instead of Saturday, but I see a lot of similarities. We're still worshiping. There's still messages. There's still a group for children and youth. And it, it didn't occur to me until later on that my family had actually kind of made this massive shift from what we can call Jewish space, right, at the Messianic Jewish congregation to Christian space. But that's, in fact, what we did for a lot of reasons. And so there, there my brother and I were uh, as pre-teens in this youth group at this, at this church. And so the issue of uh, Jewish identity absolutely remained in the family, right? Like we're going to my grandma's house for Passover uh, a lot of years. Uh, I understand my background. I understand my heritage. We're making the potato latkes for Hanukkah. Um, We were somewhere in between on the holidays. So we had the Hanukkah bush, which for my parents was like some kind of a reconciliation between a Christmas tree, which maybe we shouldn't have because we're Jewish, but not wanting to ignore Christmas because, you know, we believe Jesus is Lord. And we got to throw Hanukkah in, so let's put blue and white lights on the Christmas bush. And because it's not the full height of a Christmas tree, it's not really a Christmas tree. Anyway, some some of our audience is going, what the heck? And others are going, that's exactly what we did. I thought we were the only ones. So yes, the Hanukkah bush or the miniature Christmas tree with Hanukkah colored lights, that's my story. So anyway, it was sort of this integration and I understood, okay, we're Jewish. You know, my, my dad's family at least is Jewish. I'm Jewish. I have a Jewish heritage. But it became more and more back burner as I got more and more involved at the church. And in eighth grade, I was kind of at this spring break community service program that the church put on. Uh, Awesome worship, really uh, a cool time to kind of serve. And, you know, as an eighth grader, you're consumed with yourself. And I remember like realizing, oh, there's people with needs in the world beyond myself. And my eyes were kind of open and there was an invitation to receive Jesus as Lord. And that's when I came to faith was eighth grade. And I remember like nothing particularly special about the night when I responded to the invitation or the prayer. But I remember in the weeks that followed going, oh, something's different. Like my life, the trajectory of my life has changed and really feeling like the Lord was present with me in this relationship with him. Uh, So that happened in eighth grade. And, you know, then youth group, of course, and you kind of have this opportunity, right? 9, 10, 11, 12th grade to get serious about your faith or not. And a lot of the people around me didn't and kind of went their own way. And I felt like, no, I have to, because this is real. This is what I believe. God is involved in my life. Surely he has a calling for me, though I didn't know what it was yet. And uh, so as the years went on, I graduate high school. And again, Jewish identity always there, but kind of more and more and more back burner. And I defined my faith more and more like my peers did in the youth group, right? Like I go to this church and I have this Christian background and I'm committed to following Jesus and, you know, doing what I feel like God's telling me to do. And that was the story, which wasn't that different from anybody else's story uh, around me. So it was sort of convenient. And uh, that's how I finished high school and decided to go to a Christian college called Wheaton College out in uh, the suburb of Chicago. And uh, I was very happy. Like I was on track. I felt like I'm following the Lord. He's going to call me to do something. I'm getting a good Christian liberal arts education. Everything's cool. So when you were going to college, what were you, what were you majoring in? Were you thinking about ministry or something you know, related to outreach or, or what? I majored in business because the other part of Wheaton was like theology kids and they scared me. They were down the hill. Like the the theology kids were down the hill in the Billy Graham Center. And then the uh, business and, you know, liberal arts and pre-med and everybody else was up the hill. So everybody sort of resented each other quietly, but never talked about it. And theology scared the heck out of me. And I'm like, no, I like business. I can do that. I like numbers. I like accounting. And I was an accounting nerd. Uh, which played itself out a little bit in years thereafter, but more on that in a couple minutes. So uh, business and finance, and then in the New York public schools, 
they force you to learn a, a foreign language to like basic competency. And I hated it. I chose Spanish, hated it, misbehaved in all the classes, lots of detention because I don't know, it just felt like such a waste of time to me to be learning a foreign language. And then at Wheaton, they said, well, you have to take more foreign language classes. So somehow one night I decided I hated it enough that I should make it my minor. And I really, to this day, can't tell you the logic behind that decision. But I guess I felt like I've punished myself enough, so I need to have something to show for it. So I declared a Spanish minor and went to Spain and uh, learned the language to fluency. And anyway, business in Spanish down at the liberal arts school. And in terms of calling, I think I was really like I felt this tug about Africa and the third world. And I couldn't really explain it. But I actually had a dream once of like being in East Africa. Uh, more on that in a bit, but I felt like, okay, somehow all of this is going to lead to being involved in seeing communities grow in a way that demonstrates the kingdom of God, right? Like kingdom values, kingdom business principles in the developing world, maybe in Africa. And that was sort of the track. And so as I'm kind of entering senior year at Wheaton, that was the path I was on. And, you know, in family business, my parents uh, separated, they got divorced freshman year at Wheaton. So that was hard and sort of like, trying to deal with that. And, you know, it's a confusing thing. It's a confusing thing as a kid, but it's also a confusing thing as an adult. And by adult, I mean all of, at that time, 18 years old, an adult, quote unquote, child of divorce and processing that through my Wheaton years and trying to figure out faith-wise then, the idea of going to a Messianic congregation wasn't even on my radar. But, you know, right, like I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm good. You know, people would say, are you a Christian? And I'd say, sure, because, you know, right, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. Uh, well, you have a Jewish background, right? Well, of course. Well, what does that mean for you? I don't know. Let's change the subject. And so I started at a Baptist church in Wheaton, Illinois, very suburban Baptist church. And then I decided that wasn't quite working for me. It was cool, but it was missing some flair. So then I went over to the charismatic Anglican church down the street, which was really awesome. And I really enjoyed that and felt again, like, okay, I'm coming towards graduating in six months. I'm at this church that I like, good friends, solid identity in the Lord. Everything's good. And then everything changed. So, you know, I know now that you have a calling to the Jewish people, but at this point, where was your calling to your own Jewish identity? Back of the shelf behind a few other things I'd rather deal with because I didn't, you know, as the years went on, right? Like when you're a kid, you're sort of insulated from having to deal with the wind shear of the conflict between a Jewish identity and a faith in Jesus. And then you're an adult and your parents are focusing on their own kind of stuff and issues at that point in life. And now I'm like, oh, I got to answer for this for myself. And I began to realize my faith in Jesus, which is growing and becoming more and more serious, and I feel like it's going to have tremendous implications in what I do with my life, just doesn't reconcile with uh, my Jewish identity on my dad's side of the family. And I began to realize, oh, there's a lot of hostility and opposition in the Jewish community to the message of Jesus. And if I kind of uh, come forward with this and try to reconcile the two I felt like I was holding on to two worlds that just had nothing to do with each other. Uh, And I began to hear testimonies of other Jewish believers who said, yeah, you know, I came to faith and my family rejected me. They buried an empty coffin. To this day, they won't talk with me. And I thought, oh, man, like, I, I don't need that. Surely I can just sort of hide in the Christian community. And I met other uh, people at Wheaton who we would all kind of say, yeah, I have a Jewish background. And it was like the convenient thing to say, right? Because it's, that's who I sort of am slash was, but now I'm in this Christian world where I'm accepted like everybody else. And it's the easy answer. And until halfway through my senior year, that was, that was the answer. But, uh, and, and the idea of Jewish ministry, Carly, not even on my radar, like not on my radar. I was going to Africa to make a difference in communities. And so I went to this huge 20,000 student missions conference in December of 2003, down in rural Illinois at uh, Urbana University, and was there kind of to solidify this idea that I was called to go to Africa and see communities develop in the name of Jesus. And that's how I went. And and then, <laughs> and then everything changed. So before we move on to the and then, you know, we talk about a lot on these podcasts about how much Ezra loves coffee. So was it in college that you picked up your coffee habit or when was that? No, you know, it wasn't like I, I 
hated the taste of coffee growing up and then tolerated it in college for studying purposes. And then I think really like late 2000s when I started to travel where I was working in Chicago at the time, when you travel overseas or when you travel a lot for work, you start to crave routine, right? Like whatever that's going to look like, you crave uh, ritual and routine. So part of my routine became the morning cup of coffee, which became the morning two cups of coffee, which turned into a volume of Java that I'd rather not discuss on this podcast. Were you such a coffee snob at the time or no. were you just like, you know, any coffee? No, you take what you can get, right? When you're when you're a 20 something, you're making your, you know, you're trying to make ends meet. I remember at the time, like going to Starbucks was a luxury, right? Like, ooh, $3 and 20 cents for a cup of coffee. I'm not yeah. paying extra for whip. Forget yeah. that. Uh, anyway, that season's changed a little bit, but not originally a coffee snob. And now, well, you know, times change. Yeah. So we before we move on to the and then, um, just to our listeners, uh, if you've been listening before, you've heard us talk about the Lost Tribes Coffee Co. coffee that we have, um, which you can get on our website. But one thing that we're doing now is we are allowing you to enter a monthly coffee giveaway. So you can enter and have the chance to get one of our bags of coffee, which is directly from Ethiopia, which is one of the countries that we work in. Uh, and you can enter by texting JG, J for Jew, G for Gentile, to 474747. So we will um, pull a winner each month. So you can enter every single month. So again, if you want to enter for a free bag of the Lost Tribes Coffee Co. Coffee, you can text JG to 474747. So Ezra, you keep kind of hinting at this and then. So what is the and then of the story? Yeah. So I'm at this missions conference and they kind of encourage you to go do like silent prayer. Okay. So on December 30th, 2003, at about 5 p.m., I go down to this old, I don't know if it was like a Catholic church or what, like this cathedral kind of thing on the campus of this university, like a hundred years old, big, you know, pillars, like you'd think, like the stained glass, the whole thing, like a very traditionally Christian environment. And I kneel down on one of the pews and I'm very serious and like, I really want to hear from God. Okay. Like this is the time Lord confirm what you're going to call me to do. And I have all of my own designs and agenda about this already. And Carly, like, I don't, I don't use this language a lot unless I really mean it, but in terms of like the Lord said, but I'll say as clearly as I've ever heard the voice of the Lord, I heard him say to me, remember who you are. And I think I almost like looked up and looked around like, what? I'm sorry. We were talking about micro enterprise development in Africa, Lord. Remember who you are. And I realized like, I have to listen. Like I'm, you know, i it was just one of these. So I kind of, you know, take a, a gulp and, you know, try to continue to listen to the Lord. And I felt like he said, remember who you are, you're Jewish, and that will be your community and that will be your ministry. And I couldn't get out of that cathedral fast enough. Like I walked out, it was cold. I walked out into the snow. I'm walking around the campus. I go to get a hot chocolate. I'm somewhere between like depressed and irate because this was not the agenda. This calling back to Jewish identity, not only being called back to the identity as now a front burner issue, but also the implication that somehow I would be in Jewish ministry. All that meant to me was confusion and potential rejection and misunderstanding from family and redigging things that I had kind of buried in my soul years before because I didn't know how to deal with. And now it was all coming back to the surface and I knew it was God. And I mean, I was like, I spent pretty much the rest of the missions conference, like passive aggressive. Like I didn't participate in the communion. I didn't want to go to the sessions. I was just like emo journaling in the corner about how depressed I was about this calling, but I knew it was the Lord. So I left that conference and finished Wheaton College going, the Lord has called me back to my Jewish identity as a front burner thing in my life. And somehow that's going to now be my calling. I have no idea what that means, but there it is. And, uh, you know, for some listening, like maybe you have, you know, quote unquote, a Jewish heritage and you felt similarly, like, I don't necessarily want to deal with this. I don't know how to deal with this. My parents should have explained to me how to deal with this, but they didn't because they didn't know how. And now what do I do? And it, it can be a scary thing. It can be a jarring thing to kind of have to face a Jewish identity as a believer in Jesus who hasn't 
uh, faced that in a while or maybe ever. But just I would encourage everybody be open to the possibility that that identity matters to the Lord. And it's not by accident that he has a calling, which is irrevocable in the Jewish people. And that if you have a Jewish heritage or a Jewish identity and you feel like God's kind of, you know, tapping you incessantly to come back to that, that it's not by accident and it's not a distraction from what you are called to do. It may have everything to do with what you're called to do and may actually answer some questions you never knew how to answer. And even for those who aren't Jewish, I'm sure everyone can relate to you saying, okay, God, here's what I think that I'm going to do. Please confirm this. And then he says, no, no, this is what I want you to do. And you're like, wait, what? No, no, no. I want, I wanted to do this. What do you mean? So you're sitting in the, in the, the church or wherever you were, you, you know, you hear this calling, you, you go back to the mission conference, then you leave at some point you're graduating. What do you do after that? Do you go work for a Jewish ministry? No, I didn't because I still wanted to kind of not, I didn't deny the calling. I just felt like, well, I have bigger fish to fry. I'm graduating. I got to have financial stability. Uh, I was interested in a young lady at, at Wheaton at the time. And so we got engaged and then we got unengaged. Uh, I don't want to talk about it on this podcast. Anyway, it was a long time ago. Growing experience, lessons learned. Um, and again, I think part of that, I will say this. Part of it was I knew God was calling me to do something, and I realized that that relationship was not going to take me in the direction he was calling me to do. So that stunk, and it felt like backpedaling a lot. But the kind of necessary ending of that engagement and that relationship set the stage for, okay, now let's deal with what I know the Lord's already said. And so uh, summer of 2005, I'm working in Chicago at a— um, in the Chicago suburbs, actually, at kind of an internationally known children's and youth ministry. Why? Because I felt called to do children's and youth ministry? No, but because an internship turned into a job, and I really appreciated what the ministry was doing, big on Bible memorization. And I said, well, I can use my finance and business skills here. So I was auditing their overseas offices, which kind of checked the Africa slash overseas box as well. And it just, it was a blessing to be able to travel to South America and India and Africa during those years at that ministry and learning a lot. You know, when you graduate college, you think you know everything. And then like five years later, you realize how much you didn't and how much of a jerk you were right when you graduated to the people who were trying to tell you something. So that was, you know, maybe nobody can relate, but that was my story. And I was working there. And then one summer night, it was a Friday evening. And out of nowhere, Carly, I just like decide, you know, I remembered what I had kind of heard from the Lord a year and a half before. And I just decide tomorrow morning, which would have been Saturday or Shabbat, we say in the Jewish world, tomorrow morning, I'm going to a Messianic Jewish congregation. And so I Google Messianic congregations, Chicago, because I don't have a clue where any are. Like I didn't know anybody who was going to any. And I find one up on the North Shore uh, near Northwestern University in kind of Evanston, Illinois, and find their service times, go to their website and say, okay, tomorrow I'm going. And the message that week, because uh, every, you know, every Shabbat in the Jewish community, you're reading a portion from the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and then you read what's called the Haftarah, so it can be a portion from the prophets. And they're reading like the story of Elijah. And so the rabbi at this congregation, you know, the worship's good. They're starting to say some things in Hebrew that I'm having this weird experience of going, I don't know what's happening, but I'm remembering 20 years ago when I did know what was happening and something feels both new and and also very, very familiar. And I was like captivated. And then the rabbi's message is from Elijah and he reads the scripture, you know, Elijah's standing on the hill and the wind comes and the fire comes, but the voice of the Lord isn't in those things. And then the still small voice. And he goes, what are you doing here, Elijah? And the rabbi just kept saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? And I was like, what am I doing? I don't know. And I almost ran out of the place. But again, like I knew it was the Lord and the rest of the day, I was just sort of like stunned going, oh, the Lord has brought me back to my people as a young adult. And I don't have necessarily the uh, benefit to have grown up in the Messianic world or just the larger Jewish community. Now I have to learn it again. What I knew as a kid, I have to learn again as a young adult. And it's mine. It's not my parents. It's not my mom's who wanted, you know, her kids to know they're Jewish. It's not my dad's who was sympathetic, but not bought in. It's my own. 
And so that in 2005 really began this journey of getting back into the Messianic Jewish community, meeting other people like me who were also Jewish or had a Jewish heritage and believers in Jesus, kind of being adopted by some families in this congregation, you know, who felt bad for the Western New Yorker who was all alone in Chicago working 50 hours a week and, you know, having a lot of pasta at their houses after services on Shabbat and just kind of reintegrating into the Jewish community. And this idea of that'll be your community, okay, check that box, but that'll be your ministry. I had no idea what to do about that, right? Because God called me during during my time in university to Jewish ministry, but I had no idea how that was going to play out. I was very happy doing my finance thing at the children's and youth ministry and, you know, don't rock the boat. So you felt some type of conviction, clearly. You almost ran out of the Messianic Jewish congregation. Right. Then what? What did you do? Um, well, I decided to go back after I ran out. I didn't run out, but I almost did. I stayed for the Oneg. And for those from a Jewish background, you know that after most Shabbat services, there's food. So especially for young adults, you want to get anybody to stay for the message. You serve bagels and lox and everything else after the service. Everybody will stay till the end. So did that, met a few people, went back the next week and the next week and the next week. Did you keep working? I, I did keep working at the children's ministry because I was learning a lot. And like every time, you know, I felt like, okay, Lord, you've called me to be in Jewish ministry. Are you changing the season? And I felt, Carly, like every time I prayed that prayer, I got deeper into the children's and youth ministry. Like every time I would try to get out, I kind of got a promotion and then got more responsibility. And, you know, we're going to, Lord, get me out of here. Aren't you changing the season yet? Isn't it it's time to go do Jewish ministry somewhere? Boom. You're going, you're now in charge of the Latin America offices for the finances. Lord, isn't it time yet? Boom. You should go to India and do the audit. And it was like, what is going on? Because I couldn't get out. And I kept feeling like, as I prayed about it, like the Lord was showing me, you have more to learn here and nothing will be wasted. And so I was there for six years and like four and a half years of being back in the Messianic Jewish world, back in the Jewish community, going to events in the larger North Shore Chicago Jewish community. Th those young adults absolutely did not believe in Jesus. And that was some tense conversations at times uh, and just trying to kind of rediscover my Jewish identity and celebrate the holidays as, as a young adult, uh, still working at this Christian ministry. And the season wouldn't change and it wouldn't change. Um, but I remember probably, I don't roughly like 2008, this ministry was big on scripture memorization. And so they would print books for kids to learn and memorize the scripture. And it was like you, in order to have considered to have memorized it, you had to get it word for word, whether it was like New King James or NIV or whatever, you had to get it word for word. And so one day I'm flipping through one of these books and it's Romans 1.16. And I go, oh, I know that verse. Paul's talking about this idea of, of sharing the gospel first with Jewish people. And so I open the book and I read it and it says, begins exactly the way it's supposed to begin. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Period. There's a period there. And I thought, wait a minute, let me go back and check. Yeah, go back and check the Bible. There's no period in the Bible. It says, Power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, comma, first for the Jew and also for the Greek or for the Gentile. And the word there in the Greek is um, proton, which if you look at it, it means necessarily first. Like it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jews. Like there's a priority of the gospel to go first to the Jewish community in the providence and plans of God, and also to everyone who will receive the good news of Jesus. But there was a period in this book, and I, it was like a light bulb went on for me, Carly, because I realized, oh, a significant portion of the, of the Christian community has no idea what to do with anything that would indicate, including the scriptures itself, Romans 1, 16, anything that would indicate that God has a unique purpose and plan for the Jewish people within the larger plan of salvation. And because this ministry perhaps didn't know what to do with that, or maybe it was too complicated to teach children, they lobbed it off. And I was like incensed. Uh, something that had never really arisen in me arose, and I realized the Christian community doesn't understand what God's doing with the Jewish people, with my people. And somehow, if I and others don't say something, how will they ever know? And so that was the beginning of something that just sort of like was like this thought and flurry of emotion that I didn't know what to do with till years later. But I remember that uh, very specifically. That story that you tell always gives me 
the chills when I hear it because I can just imagine this moment of you reading it and then feeling like this moment of here's my Jewish identity and it's not being connected here. And for someone like you who's been in the church and to put that together of like, okay, people don't get this and this is important. Exactly. And I remember like at the charismatic Anglican church, I started to talk about my Jewish identity and work through that. They they were nice, but they didn't know what to say, right? Because in that world, the church is the new Israel, which according to the scriptures, I don't see that. I know a lot of people believe that. I don't see it. Uh, the church, Gentile believers are brought into the commonwealth of Israel, but they don't replace Israel, which is the root of the olive tree. But nobody really knew, Carly, in the Christian world, how to talk to me when I would say, hey, by the way, I'm Jewish and I'm a believer in Jesus. And it was like the nice kind of smiles, the nervousness. Can we change the subject, please? So it was funny because all my life, I was the one who wanted to change the subject. And then I started wanting to talk about kind of this integration of my Jewish heritage, my Jewish identity, and my faith in Jesus. And the Christian community wanted to change the subject. And I realized, oh, there's not a lot of people who kind of know how to stand in between these two worlds, either as a bridge or as a a help for somebody who's dealing with that same identity or identity crisis. And I think in the Jewish ministry world, Carly, I realized there's people out there like uh, a survey uh, was taken a few years ago, and it said that there's as many as 945,000 Christians Uh, who would identify as Christian in the American church who have a Jewish background, meaning a Jewish parent or grandparent. But when they want to actually talk about that or explore that identity, who who are they going to talk to? And there's precious few people. And that's part of why we do this podcast is so our Christian audience can understand, okay, maybe I need some language or some, some framework around how I think about Jewish believers within the household of faith. So what did you do at that point? You know, you felt like, okay, this the scripture has doesn't have a period here and what's important is the priority of the Jewish people. Did you keep working there? Did you leave? What did you do? Yeah, I, I did keep working there. I asked the Lord to leave, not because I was like offended at the at the ministry. I just thought, okay, I know I, I know that I know that I'm called the Jewish ministry. I'm back in that community. Lord changed the season. Boom, a promotion. Now I'm supervising kind of this like third, one third of the world in the in the finance department. And I thought, oh man, but I knew, okay, I still have more to learn. Obviously the season hasn't changed, but something else was going on kind of on the other side of the country. My dad and I went to visit Jonathan Burnus. We were in Phoenix on vacation in 2006. I had just gone for the first time to Israel and was super kind of switched on to, wow, the state of Israel really does exist. It really is the Jewish state. The Lord's really up to something there. There's a viable Jewish believing community that I feel like he wants to use. I need to know more. So in the, in the wake of that first trip to Israel, my dad and I go and visit Jonathan, uh, reconnect over Jewish Deli at a place called Chompy's Deli, which is now an abandoned strip mall, actually. But Chompy's was there at the time in North Phoenix. And it was good to see Jonathan. No real agenda. Hadn't connected with him in 15 years. Less hair. Both he and my dad had significantly less hair than they did the last time they had seen each other. Somewhere between none and less. Uh, but we'll be fair. Let's call it less. We'll be generous. So at the end of this, Jonathan says, hey, by the way, you know, I know your mom's a nurse. We go to Ethiopia and serve the Ethiopian Jews. Why didn't your mom come with us sometime as a volunteer? And I thought, Ethiopian Jews, what on earth is this? Like, aren't the Jews in Europe and Israel? And and it was almost the first time I had even heard this concept of like the African Jewish communities. So I sent, I was, you know, uh, an obedient Shabbat school child, uh, like I hadn't been all the years before. And I sent my mom the magazine and said, Jonathan wants you to go to Ethiopia. So she does. <laughs> and she comes back and she says, it was amazing. It was life transforming. You need to go. And I'm sitting there thinking, and I said to her on the phone, you know, woman, what have I to do with medical outreaches? I didn't say it like that King Jamesy, but it was kind of like, well, you know, I'm not a doctor. I think that's what I said. I'm not a doctor. Like, what are you telling me to go on the medical outreach? She goes, just think about going. There might be. And so I, like the minute I started thinking about it, Carly, it was like the hand of the Lord on my back. Like you need to go to Ethiopia. I'm like Ethiopian Jews. I guess I should Google them because who the heck's heard of them? And I start to read about these historically Jewish communities that are still kind of living in exile, in persecution, in famine, lots of disease going on that need help and Jewish voice is going to help these communities. And so I said, okay, well, you know, all right, I'll, I'm willing to go, but I'm 22 years old, 23 years old. You know, the trip is thousands of dollars within 
24 hours of me saying to the Lord, okay, I'm willing to go, $3,000 came in for me to go that I didn't ask for, Wow. that I didn't ask for. And so I go, okay, I'm going to Ethiopia. So I go, and at the end of that trip, the Lord is really uh, kind of, again, that hand on my back, like, this is for you. Like, this this could be the expression of the things you've asked me about, but you didn't really know how to integrate. Like, all the reading of the Old Testament, which I had done as a kid, but all of a sudden it's like 3D, what Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel have to say about the house of Israel and the regathering and the restoration of Jewish people of course, through faith in the Messiah, right? And this idea that God wasn't done with the Jewish people, not just those living in Israel, not just those, you know, my family in New Jersey and New York and Europe, but the whole house of Israel, wherever we had been scattered to the ends of the earth, like that God would actually be faithful to regather them. And as Jonathan was sharing, this is what Jewish Voice Ministries exists to do, is to regather the whole house of Israel in the name of Jesus by serving them in love and earning the right to share our faith. It was like, ding, 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 all the boxes get checked. And I said, you know, I'm, just, I'm still, again, just promoted, doing my thing in Chicago, happy. But something in me said, I have to be a part of this. I have to be a part of this. And that was early 2008. So then, like a good Jewish boy, you, you come back from the outreach and you move immediately to Phoenix to follow Jonathan and work at Jewish Voice, right? Absolutely not. I came back from the outreach, shared the pictures with people, again, put it back burner and continued working at the children's and youth ministry and got promoted, which was thrilling. Uh, but I knew, okay, something here, you know, th th this story isn't done. The story of Ethiopia and these scattered Jewish communities in Africa and Israel and beyond, something here is for me. And at the end of that trip, Jonathan Burnus and I ended up on the same flight. He was kind of continuing to Phoenix, but we both flew to Chicago together and I get out to, uh, you know, go home and he continues on to Phoenix and he hands me his card. And Carly, it was one of those like early 2000s, like remember the gold shiny card uh, that you paid extra and you get your name like in shiny gold ink. So it was that kind of thing. And it says like Jonathan Burnus and, you know, you can see like, ding the reflection of the light at the end of the word burnus on this fancy CEO card, the kind you don't throw out. And he said, call me. And I thought, yeah, okay. You know, and it's like a nice thing to say, right? Call me. Okay. Goodbye. How else do we awkwardly part ways, you know, as I get on a flight and you go home, but I really, it, it seems sincere to me. And so a year later, you know, because I moved so quick a year later, I did call him. And I left a message and I said something to the effect of, hey, I don't know what you're doing in terms of international missions with these Jewish communities, but if you ever want to expand what you're doing, I'd love to talk with you about being on board. And he didn't call back. And I thought, well, forget that. You know, that was a pipe dream. And then a month later, I'm at Chili's nursing bottomless tostada chips with the spicy salsa. And my phone rings and it's a Phoenix number. And I thought, okay. So I pick up. Ezra, this is Jonathan Burnus. I've been in Ethiopia for a month. Just got your voicemail. Let's talk to you about getting out to Phoenix. And like Carly, the tostada chips like fall from my face <laughs> because I thought it, was, it wasn't going to happen. And now all of a sudden, it seemed like a reality in the making. You came out to Phoenix. And what did you interview for at that time? What we call lovingly, affectionately, a logistics manager. And what that means is the setup people for our major outreach events overseas. And I thought, well, I can do that. You know, I can do business and logistics. Uh, sounds good. Love going to Africa. Yeah, I'll do that. And so I joined Jewish Voice. I left the place where I was renting in Chicago, which was not hard to do because it was January or end of December when Chicago is disgusting. And I said, this is my last winter here and shipped everything and got on a plane and flew to Phoenix and uh, started a Jewish Voice here at our headquarters in Phoenix in January 2010. So once you moved here, did you go to a Messianic Jewish congregation at that point? Yeah, I did. I did. And the congregation in Chicago kind of sent me out with a blessing. I was the one of the adopted 20-somethings uh, without family in Chicago land. And so they sent me out and that was really awesome. And then I connected with, again, kind of a young and growing congregation here in the Phoenix area that became home and just the warmth of the community. And it, it's hard to explain how special, if not precious it is when most of the world doesn't understand your identity kind of as a bridge between two worlds to be around people and community for whom that's their reality. And not, not only do they understand it, they live it. And so if anybody listening is like, well, why, why, you know, why can't somebody just go to a church? What's even the point of a messianic congregation? 
shared community and shared identity, right? Like why, I mean, this sounds like a little bit of a jump, but why is Islam growing so fast, right? Because it offers community and belonging. I mean, there's a bunch of other reasons too. They're pouring billions of dollars, often in oil money, into their own kind of version of missions. But what are people looking for? What do people crave? You want to belong and you want to have community who understands you and who is like you in terms of their story and who can walk with you through the challenges and the journeys of life. And so that's what the Messianic congregations in Chicago and Phoenix offered me. And, and I'm so thankful for the time I spent there. So once you came to Jewish Voice, you've been here now for over 10 years, I think. How did your understanding of your Jewish identity change? Because, you know, as you've explained, it's not like it was super solid, you know, through the children's ministry. It was like you were kind of figuring it out. Where do you feel like you're at with your Jewish identity? Right. I think it's a process that started in Chicago, you know, coming back to the Jewish believing world in my early 20s and now, you know, in my later 30s continues, but it's owning that identity. And now, you know, I just got married 11 months ago. And so not only is it, okay, this is my Jewish identity, but this is my and my wife's Jewish identity. And what are we going to do when we have kids? And so it takes on like, you know, just like any identity and heritage, right? Like the longer life goes on, the less you realize you have figured out and the more responsibility you feel to figure it out. So that's definitely a work in progress. But I think one of the big things kind of running around the world, meeting more and more Jewish communities and Jewish leaders in Israel, in Ethiopia, in Zimbabwe, in India, in South America, you know, some leaders in Australia, everywhere, some Asian leaders who whose communities identify as historically Jewish. The more time goes on, the more convinced I am, you know, that the idea, and some people are going to wince when I say this, but don't turn off the podcast yet. The idea of being the chosen people, right? Like that's language. It's a scriptural reality. And it doesn't mean we're better than or somehow preferred above anybody else. It means that the hand of God, since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is on the Jewish people to make us a blessing to all the families of the earth as we pursue holiness and we walk in righteousness through Jesus. We know there's no other way to walk in righteousness than through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah and the Savior of the world. But this idea that we actually are chosen to go be a blessing to everybody else in the face of the earth. And so not only is my identity a personal thing, it's also like at the same time, a missional calling that, you know, if I was a Jewish, if I left Jewish voice and ran 10,000 miles away, I'd still have to do it. I'd have to figure out how do you want me to be a blessing to the families of the earth because it's literally in our DNA as a people. And it's not, you know, God makes it clear, right? Like it's not because you were the best. In fact, you're the smallest, the weakest, and the most stubborn people on the face of the earth. So that's kind of our shiny business card as a people that we're stubborn, we're weak, and we're small. But God has chosen us and called us with an irrevocable calling that we need to live out. And so as Jewish believers in Jesus, I think that's that's kind of the name of the game is living out that calling empowered through his spirit within us, through our faith in, in Yeshua, in Jesus. So you came to Jewish Voice as an outreach logistics manager. I'm just going to fast forward 11 years. You eventually had those same types of promotions like you did uh, at the children's ministry. You took on the outreach departments, traveled to over 40 countries, have done, you know, numerous medical outreaches and fest festivals and really feel like this is your life calling. And this is where we are today, right? Right. This is where we are. And as you said, it's a story that's very much a story in process, still learning lessons, still love kind of meeting new, not new to themselves, but new to world awareness, Jewish communities that are emerging that say, look, this is where we are now. But we know that we come from Israel. We know we're historically part of the Jewish people and we want to reconnect to that destiny and being able to kind of be forerunners in, in talking to those communities about their identity and about the reality, according to the scriptures, that our Jewish identity is only and always fulfilled through faith in Jesus, the promised Jewish Messiah. So um, I'm passionate about it. I couldn't see myself doing anything else. And you know, my story is one like maybe some of our listeners or maybe you're, you know, uh, you have a Christian background, but you know somebody with a Jewish background. And I, I meet more and more people, if you will, like me, Carly, in our generation whose parents did the best they could or maybe didn't do the best they could instilling a Jewish heritage or Jewish identity from one or both parents. And yet we find that God's not going to let us get away from it because 
It's not a contradiction to who we are and to our faith. It's actually the fulfillment of it. And when we understand our calling and our faith in light of a faithful God keeping his promises to our forefathers by keeping his promises to us and our generation, it answers a thousand questions and prepares us to move forward with a lot more confidence. Not always easy, but we're confident it's him. Well, like we said at the beginning, this is Ezra's story so far. Maybe 10 years from now, Ezra, I can interview you and ask you these questions again, and we can tell the next 10 years of the story that God is unveiling. That would be awesome. And hopefully I'll still, well, I'll, I'll say hopefully I'll still be drinking as much coffee. My wife may not share that hope. But anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing how, how the Lord continues the story. And we're looking forward, Carly, to hearing from our listeners about their stories. If you're a Christian with a Jewish background, you're a Jewish believer, maybe you're Jewish and you're not sure about Jesus, but you you know, you want to get some questions answered, write into us. We'd love to talk with you. You're not the only ones asking those questions. You're not the only one with that kind of background or heritage, and we'd love to get you connected. Yeah, and also to anyone that's listening that has felt that calling, like Ezra explained, in his own life, but then sees that it's not coming to fruition through your own eyes. Like, you know, Ezra heard this calling, but then he just kept getting promoted and given opportunities where he was working, not in alignment with the Jewish identity part of his calling. You know, God hasn't forgotten that calling. Uh, you can see that through Ezra's own own story that it, it took time. He had things to learn. God had other plans for him in the meantime. That's the same for us as well. So just an encouragement to anyone listening. Anything, you know, God has promised you, he's told you about, he hasn't forgotten those things and he's still working those things out. Absolutely. We want to thank our audience so much for listening today. Just as a reminder, this podcast is supported by donations. So if you like what you hear, go to our website, a Jew and a Gentile discuss.org. Any donation would be helpful. Just a small one-time donation. Uh, or if you'd like to become a monthly donor, you can join our after show club where you can see behind the scenes content that we only show to our monthly members, be able to talk to us directly, etc. You can do all of that on the website. And we're so thankful for your support so we can get this content out to you. And we also offer our coffee uh, that we've talked about before on the website. You can get it as often as you'd like for a monthly donation as well. So again, the website is a Jew and a Gentile discuss org. If you want to hear more episodes, you can subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We'd also love if you leave us a review, share this podcast with someone you know, follow us on social media and engage with us there or send any questions or comments into the email on the website. And we're so thankful that you're listening and we will see you next week for another episode. The show is a production of Jewish Voice Ministries International.